Our topic for today is from first glance to close sale and what it, it really means to us in, in search marketing is this idea of we really have an advantage in internet marketing. Uh, other things that where you have to, if you put an ad in a newspaper or if you have a billboard, it's hard to tell sometimes if that will even translate into a closed sale. For us in internet marketing, we can tell quite a bit about how effective our marketing has been. You can see if you've had a contact form filled out or if you have a, uh, a phone call generated from your activity. And so we really put a lot of emphasis on creating that conversion point. And so all, all of us at Search Lab, we talk about being a conversion focused search marketing agency. And that sort of activity is what separates, I think, internet marketing from others. But what I, what I thought would be an interesting topic for, uh, for us this week is what's called attribution. So a lot of people think of internet marketing that somebody comes, they do a Google search, and they arrive on the site and they, they make a sale, right? So you come on uh, to a lawyer's website, you fill out a contact form, the SEO gets the lead. But in fact, a lot of internet activity actually works differently. You'll have this, this sort of activity happen. You'll have someone arrive on a site from an organic search. They're interested, but they're not ready to buy necessarily just yet. So they'll leave. Over the course of time, they'll be seeing ads from this website, which is actually more like a remarketing program that Tom would run. You might click on one of those ads, come back, you're still not ready to buy. Um, but over time, maybe you, you'll see a social media post at the exact right moment um, and lightning strikes and now you are a closed sale. And so who gets credit for that sale? Because in internet marketing, we all want the credit. That's the affirmation, that's your esteem, that's how you, value, how you put a value on your service, is I got you that piece of business. For some of our clients, it doesn't take very many leads. So we have like a, a client that make, puts modular designs into hospitals. If we get them one client, we pay for ourselves for a year. I really want to take credit if I'm part of that sale. Um, and so what the, the process of doing this is called attribution. <coughs> so the example I gave, if I'm the first touch point, and let's say Tom, who's running a social media ad, is the, is the last touch point, who should get the credit? How should we attribute the value of that conversion? It's very important to us. And so what, what we do is we do all these kind of models. And you can do this yourself if you're a small business owner with just free basic Google Analytics. As long as you've set everything up properly, you can test all these different models. So you might want to give me half the credit and him half the credit, first and last click attribution. You might just say, I want to make this very simple. Whoever got the last click, they get all the credit. Or whoever got the first click, they get all the credit. But at the end of the day, what I think I want you guys to get a better sense of is that your marketing, uh, your internet marketing behavior, if they're not aligned, if they're not working together, if there isn't a cohesive strategy, you're missing the boat. Attribution is an important part of telling you how effective it has been. And then I think for today, I, I'm very interested in um, in learning more, where I'm going to be a student, is more, once I give you a lead, I'm done. Like, I, I give, I, there are certain times where it's for sure. I gave you a uh, closed business. If you're an e-commerce website, I can see a receipt. I can see the package delivered. I know all that. But in a lot of cases, I don't know. I see that there's been a phone call generated from my service. I did my job. On to the next one, right? So we have Megan, who would be, do a really great job of, of talking to you about how you take that phone call, that market, marketing generated lead, and make it a close sale. And then we have Trish, who I think would do a really great job of talking about what I, what I described, how to put this whole network in place, how to look at it from a, a 30,000 foot view, and be strategic about your internet marketing, your sales, and further operations. So, Welcome to Search Lab. I'm gonna, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Jeff, who will introduce the rest of our panelists. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Mark said, thank you for coming out to our uh, third minute clinic. Uh, I just kind of want to point out: uh, feel free to follow everybody on social media. We've got their handles. We have the Wi-Fi password up over there on the wall in, in case you want to log in. 
Um, I want to start off with the introductions and I'll just go down the line. The first person I want to introduce is a partner and, and vice president of marketing at Ad Revenue or with Ad Revenue. Um, she is she's had great experience in large as well as individual entrepreneurship and has had huge success there. Uh, this is Megan Robbins. Sorry. <laughs> Is uh, Tom Bukovicius. He is a principal at Scoop Marketing, and he is like the man when it comes to paid media uh, marketing campaigns. Uh, he's also been published in several different places. You can check out his information in places like Shopify and SEM Rush, as well as his YouTube channel, uh, Customer Science. Uh, this is Tom. And here, last but not least, certainly is Trisha. She, her company, Empowered, has, it, it, by my understanding, she's so awesome that I, I, I don't understand, but she has a holistic uh, strategy, a plan to help it empower, wow, see, I really do have a hard time with this. Um, she has a holistic plan of being able to help people set up strategies to not only um, succeed and make it scalability, but it also on an individual level to help elevate the employees as well. I hope I did that justice. <laughs> and this is uh, Trisha Gow. Uh, normally in this setup, we do kind of a question and answer, and it's kind of free form. If anybody has an answer right away, please don't hesitate to get my attention, and I will bring that. Otherwise, I think I can, I'll just start off with a good one to get the ball rolling. And basically, I think most people want to know how do they calculate the value of their marketing campaign. It might be a good one for Tom, do you want to get started? Sure. So I like to look at uh, two very specific metrics. So the first metric is that to know your customer lifetime value. So you can measure it you know, for a year or you, you can measure it for like however many years of the lifespan. But the way you think about your customer lifetime value is you take your average order value times maybe frequency depending on the type of business that you're in, but you have to lock in that particular number. Now, the second very important metric is you look at the customer acquisition cost. And when you think about that metric, it's very important because you have to know how much can you afford to acquire a specific customer. And it doesn't matter which channel, whether it's you know, SEO, social media, you know, even billboards, uh, you have to know what is the cost to acquire that customer. So when you think about those numbers, you have to compare. And, and uh, a ratio between those two particular uh, metrics is the return on investment you're, you're trying to get. If you're, uh, let's say, if you want to get a 500% return on investment, you have to have, let's say, and your customer um, acquisition cost is $100, you better work harder on making sure that your customer lifetime value is, let's say, 500 bucks, right? And within that ratio, you can actually make better business decisions. Because here's a, an important aspect. In some cases, in competitive industries, the customer acquisition cost can be higher. The companies that win are the ones that uh, increase their lifetime value um, and, and uh, have better returns on whatever marketing spend that they do. So that's how I would look at it. I really love that you're sorry. No, go you're ahead, you're um, I really love that you're combining and you been able to look at marketing holistically when you are looking at your overall marketing costs as well as your overall return on that investment. You've been able to really balance those two. So it's not necessarily here are all the tactics that is driving all of my conversions, here are all the tactics that's driving all of my leads. You're looking at it as an integrated system because that's what marketing really is now. It's, it's not they came in through here, they made a purchase, we're done. Um, you are looking at them from different channels, different areas of expertise, and, and different user journeys that they're taking for it. Um, when I do look at campaigns, some of those are very clear on what is driving the action. So email marketing, which is something I'm very passionate about, um, will track exactly what are they clicking on, are they converting from that exact campaign. Same things when you're doing um, a search, or when you do have that last channel, you're able to clearly identify where they came from and how they're acting and behaving on that. Um, but what I also like to combine really strongly with that is your CRM system, your customer relationship management. So if you are tracking where someone's coming from, what their behaviors are along that journey, you're able to make a much better educated decision on where you want to spend your marketing dollars. If we know that marketing's working, that's great, but how is it working, why is it working, and where do we want to amplify those efforts? And that's where you start to really get strategic and start to scale. 
How do you, when, when you're advising business, how do you advise them to look at their marketing and how it's, how it's performing? Well, the first thing I would say is you can't show up to a marketing firm and say, figure this out for me. I don't know who my ideal client is or what I'm actually selling that's of any value, but figure it out and I would like right. results in three weeks. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you can't plug it in and it, it's like, it's not like a lamp. Right. So you have to step back from all that for a moment and figure out what your business model is. And many, you know, firms that are $100 million have not figured this out completely. They're just churning and they're not really thinking much about what they're spending and how they're measuring it. So, understanding fully who your ideal client is, what you want from them, what value you have to bring to them, and how you sing to them in marketing is where you have to go before you say, please help me execute this. The best marketers are executing, executioners of a strategy that already exists. And you can't get, you can't blame the marketer <laughs> if you haven't come to the table with anything for them to start with. Um, so. I would say that. The other thing is, if you look at it on a spectrum, you have a series of product or people and processes and technologies that make up a firm and the value of what that firm brings. And then you have marketing that sings the song about who you are, who you want, and why. And then you have, in my case, I work with all service-based firms. Then you have the business development types, which in some cases are also the professionals. Um, that have to sing the same tune that the marketing is doing so that their, their close, closing efforts are much more successful. So you have to see it as a whole picture before you can dive into marketing and say, let's optimize this part based on the fact that we understand the rest of it. What you were just talking about actually kind of got me thinking about like, the type of people you must have to deal with. You know, they come in and they're like, well, no, they're just like, ah, you know, why do, do I even need digital marketing? Or does my business dictate what I have to do? So I guess ultimately the question I'm thinking of is like, how do you deal with the digital marketing skeptic? Well, there, I mean, I work with lawyers, accountants, insurance companies, and it's, it's a struggle. There, there's two camps, right? There's the guy who says, I've been doing it like this for 35 years, but they've grown at half a percent a year are okay with that, right? That's usually not my person, because <laughs> they're not really motivated to do anything differently. And then there's the guy who says, I've been a lawyer for two years, let's plug in a digital marketing play, pay-per-click, whatever you want to apply, so that I can get tons of clients right this second. And those expectations are wrong on both ends of the spectrum, right? There are places to plug in digital marketing plays at every one of my professional service clients, but the nature of how those look is gonna be different based on what they're trying to accomplish. I'll give you an example. I have a divorce law firm in the northern suburbs. Um, very motivated client, exceptional guy, um, but his paperwork didn't work. He was spending 5,000 a month to chase divorces that were 700 to $1,200 a piece. Right? It doesn't make any sense. So he, he hired us to do the strategy part of it to help drive what the marketing messaging and signaling was first, and now the pay-per-click is working way better. He's getting way higher-end clients, which is what he wanted. So you need kind of the, the, the fuel behind it before you can be successful. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we get this a lot. I'm sure Tom does too, where uh, people have been doing business a certain way for a very long time, and they just think that that's what they should always do. And there's a little bit of just fear or trepidation about diving into digital marketing, in particular SEO. One of the things that I have always found helpful, and, and we have a mutual friend who I, I steal this line from, but don't bring an opinion to a data fight. If you have data, that really helps you. And so if you want to overcome a skeptic, it's really, really hard to look at numbers and go, you've grown a half a percent for 13 years, man. Like, in bad years, you're losing money. Um, you're hanging on. And I tell people, you know, like, I, I started my career in 2007. So I know what it's like to go through a recession. I'm like, really, like, good, steady as she goes, businesses go out of business all the time. It's really hard. Um, we're, we're in a, a moment of prosperity here, but like, if you're not hungry, if you're not looking to grow at a, a more manageable clip than a half a percent, like, you know, 
I'm not probably not for you, and, but right. I, I, would, I would say you're, you, you probably don't have this, the right kind of mentality for how to weather a storm. Right. I agree with that. If you're, <coughs> if you're just going to poo poo digital marketing from the beginning, probably not a good fit for you. And I'm not, I'm not here to change your mind. The data should be, and if you want to come to the table with an open idea, and if you are looking for solutions, this is a solution. And if you're going to limit yourself on what your options are, if you're looking for growth, if you're looking for new clients, that's a challenge with the business owner at that point. I agree with the, the points uh, I made, uh, but I would say that uh, I always look at uh, the, um, the objective of uh, the potential client. So if they came to us uh, asking uh, help for customer acquisition, I don't have to necessarily convince them that you know, they have to go with digital marketing. But uh, into the previous points, which is really how many customers do you need, right? And then calculate the closing ratio, let's say, how many leads do you need to get those customers? Now, once we know that number, let's say you need uh, 50 leads per month to uh, get this, let's say, you know, get, let's say, 10 customers a month, right? Then based on that, you have to look at which channels and what would be the cost per lead for me to go after that would make sense. So then if they would like to bring up, let's say, a billboard ad, then we can say, all right, well, billboard has, you know, $5,000 a month, depending on where you are, right? And then, you know, maybe based on this, it's difficult to track. You could probably track it, you know, with, with phone numbers, maybe with special links, but still maybe grab some statistics and say, all right, well, out of this investment, I'm going to get this many leads, cost per lead is this. Same thing, let's say, with pay-per-click campaign. This many leads, this is cost per lead. SEO, this many leads, this is cost per lead. Social media, it doesn't matter, right? But the main thing is that once you kind of figure out those numbers, let's get a little bit more specific, which kind of goes back to the customer acquisition cost and uh, the number of customers you're trying to get. Then it becomes a lot easier, and then they'll be thinking, well, I'm not sure if billboard ads is measurable, and blah, 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 blah. Well, maybe this is a bit more measurable. And then the conversation becomes a lot easier. We have a saying, I know the team here will laugh, um, but we say try it, track it, change it. And you have to try something, you have to be willing to try it. You definitely have to be diligent with tracking it, and then you have to be willing to change it, whether it's optimizing it, whether it's continuing it, or whether it's stopping it. But at least you know that that wasn't effective, or it was effective. It's kind of going off, like, trying to do things. And outside of digital marketing, like, like the billboard gets a fire all makes sense for like the like TJ fires off a highway or something, but like the county firm makes it the, the billboard market wouldn't make sense. Is there any part of digital marketing that would benefit with that doesn't benefit to businesses or would you guys say that like pretty much like they all complements each other and there's, there's no real reason to not use one versus the other? Yeah. I think when you look at where your target audience is, is going to be the most critical part of it. And Trisha, I'm sure you'll want to speak to that a little bit more, but if your target audience isn't on social media, I'm going to say that's probably not a good fit for you. <laughs> yeah, it's going to depend on the client. There's going to be, I do all professional service firms for the most part. Um, they all have some digital play, but they're all very custom based on what they're doing. There's a lot of LinkedIn play and social media for those kinds of firms. There is pay-per-click, but it has to be really well customized to exactly where they want to go with those, find their people. Um, but it's going to look very vastly different than somebody who's selling something that millennials want to buy, a like product. I think it also depends on the business goals significantly as well, whether you are playing that retention game, whether you're looking for new clients. Both of those are going to play very differently into the channels that you choose, the mediums, and where that audience is. And how much you have to spend. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's uh, no shortage of digital marketing fails that you can find online. Um, a, like a common one for us is if your service is really sort of a niche or an obscure service and you're really only targeting a small area, it tends not to go very well. So there's just not enough demand in a search engine, and we have to charge you some money for our time. Um, you know, if, we always say, like, if you're a taxidermist just targeting <laughs> Wilmette, Illinois, I'm pretty confident I could get you to rank number one. <laughs> um, I could do my job extraordinarily well, but if you, if you to, to Tom's point, if you start doing this math backwards, you're going to pay me a lot to rank number one for taxidermists in, in Wilmette, and you're not going to make that money back. I mean, there's just not enough demand for your products, and. And so we, we get situations like that a lot where it's sort of 
Um, but, but for the most part, your, your, your typical professional services, attorneys, accountants, um, even you know, home services like plumbers and HVAC people, we tend, it tends to be a very good return on investment. Going back to the question though, is there ever a business that wouldn't benefit from digital marketing? My challenge is, are there any audiences that are not on a digital platform? Like, if you're selling worms in the middle of nowhere next to a pond, maybe not. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> I, I was really strong. I'm pretty sure with the pond, if I'm on a pond, I'm pulling out my phone quite a bit. Yeah, you're probably not the target. <laughs> I'm a very good fisher person. <laughs> I'll add a couple of things. Uh, so uh, I agree with that, your points uh, about uh, the audience <laughs> and fishing. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, so it, it, the, the big question, who your audience is, that's the first question. And the second question that I would add is, which platform can reach your audience? Because right now when you think about Facebook, pretty much almost everybody's on Facebook or whatever other platform. Now the question is, does Facebook have the targeting capabilities for your type of person? Because as Mark has mentioned, uh, if you're looking for some very obscure niche, maybe from the search perspective it may be limited, but maybe you can kind of like uh, carpet bomb, uh, you know, Wilmette, Illinois and say, Hey everybody, <laughs> who has this particular problem? <laughs> if you're interested, we have a special. Come on over, you know, we have this coupon or we have a free consultation or we have some sort of offer. And then some people will kind of select themselves who would be interested in that particular situation. And then if we kind of layer that with demographics, psychographics, other kind of like a, other data um, that kind of like the privacy folks they don't like about, <laughs> And Facebook is reacting to, but but that's very good for marketing, right? Then you can actually reach them, let's say, through Facebook and uh, or, or other platforms. So it's really about the targeting capabilities of that platform as well. Okay, I, I feel like you guys have touched on a few things that are part of uh, the media campaign. So what, let's try to get like a, a more of a, a full answer to it. And what's needed for a successful campaign, and and how do you measure that, or what should you be measuring during that? Well, I would say, you know, there's a couple of things. I think of this very much like a, a sales question. So if you're a good salesperson, you're doing a lot of listening to your prospective client. So what is, what are the, what are the, what's their motivation for talking to you in the first place? Do they need more, the most common thing is we need more revenue. We need more people in our store. We need more people calling our phone. Um, but it's not the only reason. There could be, sometimes we get people who are like, I am not sleeping at night, I work all the time on the weekends, and I just need someone to help me. I need work taken off my plate. And so a big part of what, what we're trying to do in our sales process is listen a lot more and talk a lot less. Like, if, they are, if they're telling you they have a problem, you should listen to that. The most common thing is we want more, uh, more clients, we want more customers, we want more business. But that's not always the case. So being being able to listen is, is very important. And then once you understand the the problem, you know it's it's much easier to understand the methods. It's like these three M's. You have uh, the motivation, the money, and the methods. So if you if you understand the, the motivation for hiring you, you can understand the methods that would work. You know I might say, hey, you should get with. Tom, because I think this is really a, a, a paid search campaign. I think that's the right method for solving your problem. And I think you should pay him X amount of money. I mean, that's that's sort of how it, how it works. Um, but those are sort of the, the pillars of how we how I look at it. I think that translates to the campaign itself, though. Mm -hmm. Very, very well. Right. What are the motivations? What are the methods that we're using? Or what are the goals of the campaign? What are the different methods or channels? Correct. And then what's the money and the monetary investment that we're going to put into that? Um, for a successful campaign, I definitely want to touch on, on what that message is. Because just finding people and hoping that they come to your site and say, please, please, please give me money, doesn't work too well. You have to give them some compelling reasons. You have to talk to them as individuals. You have to understand what their pains are what their challenges are, and directly connect that with how your product or service is going to help solve those problems. Well, uh, I'll go back to those two initial metrics. Uh, customer lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. 
that means you have to have a clear objective of what you're trying to accomplish with that particular campaign. Then you have to have tracking. Tracking is very important. Yeah. I would say it's very neglected in the digital marketing space. Oh. Some companies love to track only, let's say, web forms. That's kind of like, it's, it's, it's a nice to have. But then we track phone calls as well. We track pretty much like everything, pretty much all the touch points with a business. Because then we can attribute back, going uh, back to Mark's initial point. And then, actually, we like to take it to the next level, if possible, if the technology allows, tie everything back to the CRM. So, for example, for social media uh, ads, for paid search campaigns, we either connect that stuff to a client's CRM systems, or we connect everything to the Google Sheets. So, clients get, let's say, here's Joe Smith, here's their phone number, here's the keyword that they use, or here's the Facebook audience that we targeted them. And now we can ask their salespeople, did you close them at the end of the month? And then what is the closing ratio? So this goes back, number of leads, cost per lead, times your closing ratio, gives you your customer acquisition cost, and then you can say, what did you get? How much revenue did you get from this? All right, what was the cost? Boom, here's your ROI. That's an interesting, pro I, I had never, do you get uh, pushback from clients to be like, I'm not like MIC or I'm like, you just, just be my marketing guy, and I'm like, uh, how, how do you overcome sort of? We give you a spreadsheet. Because what we have seen when we delve deeper into the lead generation game, once we give them a bunch of leads, sometimes they say, well, it's, um, well not all of these leads were qualified. All right, well, exactly, I get it. I, I said, you know what, let's yeah. take that out of the picture. Here's a spreadsheet. You tell us what's not qualified. We'll, we'll optimize based on what's qualified. It's a game changer. So you, you legitimately are tracking to the closed sale. When you can get into the CR. That's what it seems like. I mean, it's not 100% accurate depending on like the feedback that we get, but but yes, it's much more closer. So we're, we're trying to close, pretty much we're trying to track to the revenue or customers or what. It seems like a much healthier approach. Like, I would be curious, like, the, uh, we're, mar we're, we're the marketing team, and a lot of times we're, we're marketing in their sales, and there's this yeah, wall. I what think it, it would be dangerous not to yeah. have purview into the whole picture when you're doing your work. You can't be great at it. I, I, I would ask them to go one step deeper than that, all that and say, is this the client I intended? Right. Um, because taking anybody with a pulse is not why you engage this in the first place, right? I mean, if that were the case, you could just sit there and wait for the phone. Call. I don't, I'm completely against that. If it doesn't align with your brand, then you shouldn't take the guy because he has a paycheck. There has to be a reason that they align with your brand and bring the most value to that person. And that's what you're searching for. You're not searching for anybody. You're searching for this unicorn. And that's why you need digital marketing to help you. We have some experience with the sales team and the marketing team. <laughs> so we're very familiar with what does that look like. And, and even if you do find them the best leads in the world and they're not qualified or they didn't convert, sometimes that's not the marketer's challenge but it is something that we're responsible for. And that you're gonna be judged on. And that we definitely get judged <laughs> on. So I love that you're Whether breaking right that up um, to each step because that's, that's really when you're looking at your full marketing funnel, there's multiple layers to this. There is the acquisition, there is the conversion, but there's also the retention. And each one of those steps has a different marketing skill set as well as a different sales component to it as well. So making sure that those are both singing together, they're singing the same song. Dig in your singing analogy. I like to sing. <laughs> I don't. Um, but you know, even further than that, it should it should cause you to pivot your business model based on what happens with sales and marketing at some point. Right. What you're offering should change and morph and get better as you go if you're doing marketing and sales right. Oh, that's great too. When you're looking at what the profitability, or you look at your profit margin, what's getting the most conversions. Mm -hmm when you start looking at and diving deeper into the actual business model and how that's showing up on your marketing. You know, you do a beautiful job at that. Well, it's, I keep hearing sales, I keep hearing marketing, and in my head, it's two different, it's almost like two different departments, two different heads of the business. So what are some tips to get them to work collaboratively towards the subjective that you guys are talking about, to work towards the ROI. I, sorry. I actually last night was on the phone with, um, when I was at another, I was corporate side for a while, and I was on the marketing team. And one of my close friends, um, now close friends, was on the sales team. And 
we were chatting just last night. He let me know, oh, this is what's happening in marketing since you left, and so and so's gone, and they've done this. They have do the little dog and pony show. These are the offers we're sending. This is the messages that we're having. This is what's driving our campaign, and this is why you guys should care. And giving them that targeted list, and even saying, here's who we're messaging to. Here are the people that have an offer in their system. Call them, reach out to them, make sure that you're getting that touch point because there's the opportunity. It's not make marketing, make all the dollars, make the sales team make all the dollars. It's how are we working on those together, which goes back to the attribution costs that we talked about earlier. Yeah. I think the other one that's interesting to me, and Tom, maybe you can speak to it a little bit, is we're not usually, we're an outside agency coming in. A lot of times they'll have salespeople, they don't have a marketing department. So we're not, we're definitely, definitely not on the same campus, much less like, it's kind of hard, you know, like you're, you're, how do you, how do you overcome that challenge or, you know, if, if you're trying to work with a sales team that's, it could be in Portland, Oregon, for all you know, you know. So, we have technology, right? That's right. There's go to meeting, there's, <laughs> there's go to meeting, so, so we, have, we have to have a conversation, but we typically, during the onboarding process, we identify who will be the recipient of those leads, for example, if it's a lead generation program. And how do we forward them? And the other thing is that what will help them to make the sale better? Because what we like to do, if there's an opportunity, uh, we connect it to, like we have like this technology, we use this technology called uh, like Zapier, and otherwise we can actually send them, send them an automated email saying like, here's who this person is, maybe here's the, the ad, or here's what they have seen. So in other words, we're kind of like, Giving the lead, giving them a lead on a silver, silver platter, so they have a better opportunity to, uh, to, to, to to be closed. And sometimes what we also do is that we say, what question can we ask them as soon as we complete the lead, or what can we do to make the sales process easier? Because at the end of the day, they know that they they have a certain sales quota. What's going to happen is that if, if they don't close, they they may blame us. So we try to bring this up front, and we say like, hey, I know that there will be situations when the leads are not honored and qualified. What can we do to make the whole process easier? Because at the end of the day, this whole program, you're going to get leads. And for us to stay in business, like I work with you, you have to close those leads. Who are you typically we... asking that question to? Is it the business owner, the head of sales? Is it different for every campaign? Different for the size of the business, but typically it's whoever engages us in the first place. So if this is a business owner, we would ask him, is this the business owner or is this like somebody else in the sales team uh, trying to uh, you know, close those leads? Right. Uh, for example, I'll give you a, an example, an insurance company. So we talked to a business owner initially, so the agreement is with a business owner, but then we're talking in a, pretty much on an, almost on a daily basis with a salesperson who's supposed to close those leads. And then we are in constant interaction and then they let us know, hey, there's a drop off of leads, some of these were not qualified. You know, here, here are these submissions that you should uh, maybe like give us less of. Like, because it's a waste of my time. I'm like, all right, well, no taken, we adjust the campaign. But it's like, it's based on real data they, they get. Because one thing is to think about the cost, the other thing is that resources. Typically, in most organizations, salespeople are not 100% commission salespeople. Mm -hmm. You pay them a salary plus commission, and sometimes just a salary. If they waste a bunch of time on unqualified leads, well, guess what? It's not just unclosed business, it's really a wasted opportunity. So you have to think about that as well. So we talk to them, we bring this up at the beginning of the sales process and say, how can we work together? And then typically they, they bring the those answers. Sometimes we need more probing and say like, hey, what's really helping? Yeah. I can think of oh. I This is more a question for Patricia. I sense that it's harder. Sometimes salespeople in marketing, this is the, the common line, they'll butt heads or that they can be different. I would think that that is something where leadership should come in and do something. But it seemed like you felt very strongly about this this story. Yeah. And then uh, you know. To, I'm dealing with a lot of firms like you that don't really right. have centralized marketing. Mm -hmm. It's basically up to the business developers who are also the te technicians in these right. companies a lot of times. Um, but frankly, the salespeople could help drive what the messaging is based on what's resonating in the market too. So they should be, frankly, they should be coming up with whatever happens together as one cohesive implementation. That's true. Um, but yeah, frankly, the firms that I'm working with that are mostly professional service firms, 
they don't know how to engage with marketing to begin with. So they hire a marketing director and that poor person basically right. fills out proposals and that's all they do and they don't have any juice in the organization to get anything really done. It matters to anybody. Then they think, well, marketing failed because, <laughs> because they didn't engage them well. I'm trying to put some, uh, some constraints around this, but let's just say just a, a decent sized law firm or accounting firm. How often do they even have sales? Marketing, head of sales, head of marketing. They don't have a head of sales because the lawyers are the accountants. Yeah, they, yeah. In like I was a partner with EY, so EY is a global right. accounting firm, two hundred thirty thousand employees. They had business development execs that helped those of us that were client serving sell into big firm, big Fortune fifty firms. So they understood how to pair those two things together, um, and we had a gigantic marketing. Thing that was all about brand awareness mostly. Um, but they didn't really talk to each other. You just figured it out, right, based on what marketing told you. Um, and in so many of those places, though, it's, it's, they're unique in that the person's brand gets you a pretty large percentage of the way to a sale. And not, like if you think of a middle, middle market law firm or a middle market accounting firm. I love Joe. I know Joe will get it done for me. They don't think that it's this firm called anything. I, know, I just know I can trust Joe. So alignment under this umbrella of brand to each individual so that it resonates through the whole thing and you're all singing the same song again is can take you from 3% growth to 15% growth without trying very hard because they're not really focused on strategy at all. Well, we'll add a couple of things. So what we also do is we show the ads to the salespeople. Yeah. And, and sometimes we ask them, like, hey, what will make you more competitive? Because what makes for example, if it's a smaller firm, you say, like, well, there are these big companies. They'll say, you know what, we're good because we respond quickly. And uh, the other bigger firms, let's say, they you know, they take, let's say, 24 hours. So that in one particular situation, we actually used uh, the response rate, which is, like, they can respond within 10 or 15 minutes. We use that as an ad. Because now that like here's the person, they'll be calling back within 15 minutes. It helped us to increase the, the number of leads, and it also helped them to pretty much like they, they felt good because they, they can say, hey, those leads are good, and they're responding, and I'm responding to them quickly, so it's, it feels like a good collaboration. Yeah. For us, when we start uh, any of our marketing implementation, we always start with that strategy. What is that marketing strategy? What is our strong footing, and what are we basing this strategy off of? And we're bringing the whole team to the table for something like that. We're bringing the business owners. We're bringing whoever's responsible for marketing. We're bringing the sales team because they all hold that brand pillar. They all understand what their challenges are. They all understand their audiences differently. So when you're able to have um, a mastermind session, a brainstorming session, or a documentation session to really understand what's happening in the business and the organization, it brings everyone closer to the execution. It gives everyone a piece of ownership and a stake in it, which is really important. And it creates better and more effective campaigns. You guys have talked about some of the challenges um, facing each business. What would you say, if you had to pick a few, some of the most common mistakes that are made in a digital campaign? Not having a clear goal. <laughs> No strategy. No, no strategy. Goals. Let's let's jump into this People social think media. It's plug and play. I mean, let's jump into an SEO. We need to be found. Why do you yeah. need to be found? What is the goal of being found? Why are we doing this? Right. And I find when someone says, "I need marketing," <laughs> why do you need marketing? That's really true. Right. Yeah, I, I, I bet Harry was here. You can probably relate to this too. I get this one a lot where they go, "We did, um, you know, we did our SEO." Two years ago, it went great. And why isn't it working? And you go like, we had a client come come in this week. He's like, you know, when I was working with you, it was going great. Why isn't it working anymore? What do you guys do? And you go, it's like, you can use the word SEO and marketing interchangeably. It would be like saying, I was doing marketing two years ago. What happened? <laughs> you know, well, you stopped doing marketing, so you stop. It stops working. Um, I get that one all the time. It's like, well, we kind of SEO'd it up, and now it's good, right? So I can stop paying you, and you <laughs> know, forget it. It's all good, you know. You're like, 
this is marketing. You 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 keep doing it, or you're. It's all about you relative to your com competition. So if you stop, they're not going to stop. They're going to keep trying to improve and improve and improve. And before long, your market share is gone. And, um, and so that's a common one where people just, it's, it's a misunderstanding of the service. So it takes, um, you know, we're, we're having a great conversation about sales, but it takes a salesperson to really explain this. Because a lot of people, they know, they could be tremendous accountants. You know, tremendous, like, they're the best lawyer in Chicago, and they don't get it. They don't understand. It's not only that they don't, they're sort of like, I don't like it. You know, it's, it's, I know I need it, I get it, but. Yeah, they have to engage fully in it right. to be really effective. So my big, I would say the biggest thing I see is, is cl potential clients who think they can create digital marketing, and then they don't have to do anything else to acquire a client. Like it's going to be some magic thing where they're just going to come to me and in my brilliance they're going to sign up. It doesn't work that way because it's almost every firm I work with is everyone, it has to be relationship based. It, it's a tool so you get more qualified people in front of you. It is not the end all of what you have to do in the process. So the big mistake is uh, no tracking because uh, yeah. uh, we've seen that uh, a lot of companies they don't track what they do, and or sometimes like even uh, firms that they work with they may not you know opt in for tracking. So sometimes it's easier like when there's like oh well we're spending money we're getting clicks for example it's all great but then in reality it's it's typically programs like that get killed pretty quickly after a couple months because when the spend goes up and then you're like well I can't really measure see the return it must not be working. So so tracking is very important pretty much and tracking all the points. Uh, that's another one. Uh, pivot, like not pivoting. Uh, as Mark has mentioned, well, things have stopped, right? One day, but really, market changes every day. Doesn't matter which channel that you're working on. Let's say you're using PPC, you're using SEO, you're using social media, email. People's like com new competitors coming in. People's behavior changes quite a bit. We like to re-evaluate everything every 90 days to see if we can adjust our uh, marketing. Uh, to ensure that we are up to date with what's happening. That's very important. And sometimes even like with the internal data, uh, you know, maybe you're not closing this particular area as much. Maybe your offers don't work anymore because your competitors copied you. So guess what? you got to come up with something else. Right. So that's another one. And uh, let's see, like a, the final one would be not stepping into your customer's shoes. Especially if we're talking about professional service firms, they know their craft very, very well, and then they're going to say, especially like with the lawyers, they're Maybe egotistical, right? Oh, I'm the best, you're right? Kidding, right? <laughs> but really, you're solving a problem for somebody else. So, trying to understand your customer and step into their shoes and talk about, like, okay, so here's the targeting, here are the potential problems that they are having with. Here is the problem that I'm trying to solve. And then finally, the offer, which is very important. Here's what I'm going to offer to them against what our other competitors are doing to get them in the door so they can have a conversation with you so you have an opportunity to sing your song uh, and, and uh, influence them to work with you. Yeah. The good news is so few firms are really getting it right that if you do, you're going to be fantastic. You're going to dominate. Yeah, I, sadly, Jeff, I feel like I could keep going on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot. Yeah, it's a good topic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I did notice Tommy mentioned in paid ads, you know, get your results and then the spend starts going up. It did kind of bring to mind, it's like, how do you know, how do you determine or, or figure out what's overkill or what's too little to even make a difference when you're, you're trying to, to look at your spend or, or manage that? So it goes back to your objectives. Uh, if you're trying to get five more clients a month, versus 100, your spend will be very different. And it also goes back to the math, right? How many, uh, so how many leads do you need to close that sale? So in other words, it goes back to your objective, right? So whether you're getting, trying to get five or 100 uh, customers a month, your closing ratio per channel will really determine what the, uh, how many leads you need, right? And the cost per lead will really dictate, and the cost per lead is influenced by your conversion rate on the website. So if your conversion rate, conversion rate on the website sucks, I mean, it's like 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, 10%, 
guess what? You'll need a lot of clicks and it will cost you a lot of money to get those clicks. So it really, just to kind of like going back to the math, like there's a full cycle that you have to think about uh, and, and, uh, and, and the channels that you're investing in to determine whether you're spending too little or too much. What I think is interesting with that as well is that's just looking at that initial spend. You can also spend on each layer that you're adding to that. If you need to change your website, you might need to invest in that. And then mm -hmm. without adding any more to your pay-per-click spend, you've now increased your conversion rate. Right. So at different levels, you can and things will fall off too. There'll, there'll be things that didn't resonate and you just get rid of them and focus on the things that did. Yeah, I mean, for an SEO campaign, for us, it's, it's always about your other competitors. So if I'm, if I'm uh, competing against a very small, in a very small marketplace of taxidermists in Walmart, you don't need to spend hardly any money because there's just not anybody out there. If you are looking for a personal injury attorney in the loop, you're going to be like the other SEOs who you're, you're, you're going against black belts. You know, you're going against really good other SEOs, you need to spend some time and some energy and some of your client's money to get the outcome you need. And so for us, this this applies all the time in SEO. Your, um, your investment, your money is really all about your, your competition. You need to get, do you need to get a lot of backlinks? Do you need to, you need a new website to compete in the marketplace? Um, yeah, if, so if you don't, offer. Yeah, I can, 80% of them can be Right. If you don't know, if you don't know what you're competing against, you know. If I said, yeah, I take, I'll take your five hundred dollars. I'm just taking your money. Like you're not, you're not even close um, to being a competitor in that marketplace. If you said, give you a hundred thousand dollars a month, you're like, might be. <laughs> Again, I'm probably taking your money. But I'll give you. I'll be the only employee I got. You know. Depending so. upon how the business structure is as well, I'm sure it will depend that spend. If you are a professional service firm, you can't have 500 new clients in a month. You are going to explode. You physically cannot make all of those phone calls. You cannot do all the follow-ups. So you're also wasting money on too much lead generation that you need. So balancing yeah. those goals. But I already never say that. Just <laughs> that's the dream, right? That hasn't happened yet, but when it does, you guys will hear about it. But it's true. I mean, I have a, a client right now that cannot follow up with the leads that they're getting. And so the process. There's some conversations in the works. But when I hear that we have our pipeline full, our, our salesperson cannot follow up. They're getting bogged down with delivering the service. They can't convert these leads. They're sitting there for weeks at a time. That doesn't do them any good either. No, it hurts your brand. It hurts your brand. It hurts your profitability. And then you're just throwing money at marketing if you can't close it. You can't follow up. Good. Um, I just, I, I guess I'm just a little curious here. We have just a few more minutes and I didn't know if you guys wanted to, if you haven't already covered your favorites, want to provide any kind of inbound marketing tactics that you are using or you would recommend a business use? <laughs> um, I think that CRM is really the most valuable marketing tactic that you have. And I know that doesn't seem like a typical tactic, but that is where you're doing your tracking. That is where your hub for all of your strategic partners, that is your hub for your current clients, and it's understanding that lifetime value, when you need to reach out to them, what you need to say, and what's happening with them. So that's going to be the hub that all of the other tactics are going to be pulling from and understanding and utilizing that information. Not really the inbound marketing tactic, yeah, no, but it's cool. Sorry, inbound marketing. I'm a firm believer that you have to know who you are first before you can do any of this stuff. And, and I think 90% of firms don't really know who they are and who they want to serve and why. And I know it sounds very Simon sinek who's one of my favorite people in the world, but you have to know who you are first before you can do anything for anybody else. And marketing doesn't work if you don't know who you are. <laughs> okay, this is, this is a hard one because I think there is what we, a lot of times we, these are called like growth hacks or hacks in my industry where you have some sort of like goofy tip that works for a little while and then it doesn't. I, you know these as well as I do. But like what I would say, um, 
And so I think it's, it, I, I want to get away from that sort of conversation. What I think really works, if you want the techniques that really work, they look more like flywheels. They look more like what Megan said, where it's you know, test the track and change it. Is that right? Try it, track and change it. Try it, track and change it. Um, they, they look more like a process, an orderly process that goes, and, and you, you have it tracked super well, so you can make decisions about it. It's not like, hey, I, uh, I'll tell you what, you can get on YouTube for, you can yeah. rank number one on YouTube for any yeah, term you want. Yeah, you can a month um, yeah. it, Right, so these, these things, they'll, and I'm not even, I'm not bashing it. Like these things, there are plenty of people who make a living doing this kind of thing, but it always, always ends. I've seen it forever where you've got, you see these businesses go, whoop, and the the ride up if you if you're comfortable playing whack a mole like that's that's a that's a scary thing to me. Um, for a more sustainable business model, I think you want things to look like a, a flywheel or a an orderly process, and that is that's the then you just sort of hack in inside those things. So if you're like, okay, we need um, we need to track a new conversion point because now we're offering a newsletter. Um, I want to see this is the newsletter is going to the marketing part. We're going to track it here. I want to see how well this is performing, what the response is. That's that's really what it is. Sort of like one off. It's just it's it's a it's not the right way to think about it. I, I think you're you're going down a dangerous road. I'll add to Mark's point. Um, it's, it's not a hack or anything, but it's uh, the basic because I, I love to focus on the basics first. Yes. Then think about. Oh, actually, I have like this weird uh, saying, you know, silver bullets are full losers. Uh, execution is key. And where this is coming from, really, is that don't be looking for hacks. Think about the basics first. So one of the big basic is figure out your funnel metrics. Right. Here's how many leads I need to get a customer. Here, like, here's a customer acquisition cost. Here's the value that I can get. Now, what's my closing ratio? How many leads do I need? What's the cost per lead, right? How many clicks to it? Like, what's my website conversion rate at right, for per channel? You know, SEO, email, pay per click, you know, social ads, and then figure out uh, the, the metrics because the traffic will cost differently at, at different channels. So you, you'll know what the cost uh, per lead is. Once you know these columns, separate metrics for each channel, you'll make you'll be able to make better decisions because. If you want to do it uh, yourself, great. But then, if you hire somebody, or if you hire, let's say, or if you hire somebody internally, let's say, you know, a specialist in, in your company, what you're going to have to do is you, you'll still hold them accountable based on those metrics per channel. So then, as a business owner, you can actually manage your business and manage your customer acquisition program or retention program with clear metrics and clear objectives in mind. 